please find a comfortable place to sit. Place your hands on your legs. Close your eyes or keep a soft focus on the screen. Take a deep breath in and out. A deep breath in and out. Continue to breathe deeply and slowly. Feel relaxation flowing down from your head into your neck, into your shoulders, down your arms, and into your hands and your fingers. Relax down into your chest, into your stomach, and down your legs, into your feet. Continue to breathe deeply and slowly. Okay. Welcome to the fourth lecture of my happiness class. The topic is the biology and psychology of feelings. The biology of feelings focuses mainly on the brain. A great deal of progress has been made in mapping those parts of the brain that specialize in certain aspects of our abilities and our how we see the world and our understandings of things. The distinction between the hemispheres of the brain, for example, is uh, rather interesting. The left hemisphere, left side of the brain, specializes in pattern recognition. It is specializes in, in language categorization and analytical task is associated more, more with the reasoning abilities of human beings. And some would say it's the seat of the ego. The right side of the brain, the right hemisphere, specializes more in finding meaning, in creativity, intuition, in spatial processing, a number of what you might call the more creative and non-logical aspects that are nonetheless very important to our, to our experience of life. One of the... Um, more interesting experiences, I think, about this comes from Jill Bolt Taylor. She gave a TED Talk about the time that she had a stroke in the left hemisphere of her brain. 
And her thought was is that this immobilized her ego for a while, and she was relying on the right side of her brain. And what she spoke about, suddenly seeing no distinction between self and everything else, becoming one with the universe, feeling a deep peace and love, is actually what Maslow called a peak experience, and he studied those. But through her thinking was, it was because the ego was shut off for a while, and she couldn't really function very well, but it was a beautiful experience. So she somewhat testifies to the almost magical qualities of the right hemisphere, if you will. Another part that is associated with what we call basic tax, tasks and instincts, natural reactions without having to think much, is called the limbic system. Uh, some call it the lizard brain part of us that, that's uh, around, around the uh, base of our spinal cord that handles more of the automatic things that our body does. We don't have to think about our heart beating or breathing, etc. That that's, those are automatic, and that is part of the function of the limbic system. What they call it the lizard brain, as I said. Now, human beings developed more and more brain, if you will, to the front, and the f front part of the brain is called the neocortex and it is associated with more complex subtle feelings not just the simple reactions of the limbic system but the complex subtle feelings that that we feel supposedly are that is associated with the our frontal lobes the neocortex part of the brain Interesting enough, they've, they've, when it comes to um, the impact of feelings, or let's say the, the impact of, of feelings on our actual biology, they found that the neuronal connections, we have neurons in the brain, and it's believed that through their communication somehow, you know, uh, that uh, sending on of, of a signal is that it creates, some believe that it creates consciousness, but certainly is associated with all these different functions of the brain. They found that the neuronal connections are uh, affected by the predominant mode of feeling. For example, if you have a predominant mode of negative feelings, depressive feelings and thoughts, your brain is wired one way, but if you change that pattern of thinking into a more positive feedback loop of positive thoughts and positive feelings, the brain actually rewires itself. The neuronal connections change and rearrange themselves. So you might say in a way that, that um, it isn't just the brain causing the feelings, that uh, the feelings themselves are rewiring the brain. An interesting phenomenon actually. Uh, it, used to be, it used to be believed that uh, the brain was pretty static, it wasn't going to change, but now through modern technology, they've been able to find out that, yes, it does indeed change, and your feelings have an impact on how it, we're wired in the brain. One of the interesting aspects of, uh, or focus of research became a focus on genetic twins who were separated at birth and grew up in different different families. Uh, oftentimes they didn't know of each other. The reason that this became a, a real focus of research is, is that there have been 
amazing synchronicities, amazing parallels of the lives of these twins who were separated. Uh, the similarities, sometimes absolutely mind-blowing types of things, the, the patterns of, of, of their life and, and ending up doing the same thing, could only be explained through what the researchers believed by the fact that they had the same genetics. Therefore, when they started to examine the happiness levels of these twins, it's usually done by questionnaires, etc. But what they found was is that twins had a remarkable similarity in levels of happiness. These separated genetic twins. And this finding of just how often genetic twins were going to have the same level of happiness was going to lead to a belief of just what a strong effect our genes, our genetic disposition, if you will, have on us. That was the only explanation they could come up with at the time. And the evidence here is because of, of remarkable similarities of these twins, and they could only explain it by the fact that they shared the same genes, that happiness re researchers start started to talk about a set point of happiness that are determined by genes. Um, everywhere from 25% to 50% of our happiness levels were supposedly genetically created. In other words, it's not something you, you can control. Uh, if you have a low set point of happiness, then uh, I guess you lost the genetic lottery. But that became um, part of, of the research, and a great deal was said and talked about this. And this is, became the set point theory. It says a person with a low baseline of happiness can become generally happier. I mean, there's still a larger, large percent of our happiness that they can do something about. But it would say it is unlikely that a person with a low baseline could achieve the level of happiness of someone who had a much higher baseline. So this was one of the findings that, that the belief that we are genetically uh, predisposed to levels of happiness. And talking about the set point theory became um, a kind of a truism among the happiness researchers. But I have a problem with this theory. First of all, the only explanation they had was genes. In other words, it's biological determinism. Our genes produce our consciousness, is basically what they're saying, and our genes produce our levels of, of happiness that we're predisposed to. Now, all of this is based upon the research into identical twins. But there has been a great deal of research, some of it going back over 50 years, that have been replicated around the world in all kinds of varieties of research that are showing that this idea that our consciousness is coming out of our brain and biology uh, probably isn't true. And what the evidence is strongly showing is that there seems to be shared consciousness. And I'm not talking about some fringe science here. I'm talking about research that involved top scientists using impeccable research design repeatedly coming up with very strong evidence that our consciousness is not just 
kept here in a brain and that it is shared. Now, I'm not going to say that, therefore, it's true, but one thing I will say, especially in regard to this twin research is, is that if humans do have shared conscious consciousness, and twins, genetic twins, could reasonably be said to be more sensitive to each other at that level, then this gives a totally different interpretation to the remarkable findings of how twins live much the same lives and have the same dispositions, and sometimes mind-blowing coincidences, that a lot of researchers could only explain by genes. This would give an alternative explanation and it would kind of throw out the set point theory as a genetic disposition. So one thing I will say is, is that there is reason to doubt the basic assumptions of a lot of the research that went into coming up with the idea of the set point theory that is genetically determined. Now, when we move from the biology of, of what's happening in, in the brain and what, what seems to be associated with, with feelings, and move to the psychology. And this is, cannot necessarily be de determined so much by, by um, what we can see with microscopes or connecting my electrodes to our brains, that the psy psychology of feelings is based upon what you might call the inherent connection between what we feel and what we think. Because very few of our feelings, only the most instinctual of our feelings, are directly caused by what you might call uh, uh, something happens, we automatically react. Kind of the limbic system is, is associated with that. That most of our feelings, almost all of them, are actually caused by our judgments of our perceptions. We live as if something happens that we perceive through our senses out there and that somehow automatically causes our feelings. But of course that isn't true. All our perceptions are our data. You know, light coming in through our eyes, uh, uh, taste, sound coming into our ears, etc. That's raw data. And doesn't mean anything until our program and our mind gives it meaning. That's inherently true. And our feelings are responses to our judgments, our interpretations of what is happening. So they are not direct. What is really going on is is that our thoughts and judgments, our interpretations of what's happening is what causes our feelings. Our feelings come from something internal, not directly external. This is a pretty important understanding right, that if our feelings are determined within us rather than without, that gives somewhat of a clue to what we might do to be able to change our feelings. So, if this is true, we have a rule for understanding 
what causes feelings and what causes relatively negative ones and what causes relatively positive ones. The rule is negative thoughts, and they're negative because of the judgments or negative interpretations of what's happening. Negative thoughts equal negative feelings. Positive thoughts, positive or no, no judgment at all, equals positive feelings. This is a general rule of feelings and what causes negative, what causes positive. This is a truly important insight to understand is that our thoughts are directly involved in most of our feelings to say the tenor of our thoughts. Now, this would mean that the art of managing judgments is essentially the art of managing feelings. And I would I tell students, you know, this is really good news. It may be difficult to manage what goes on in your mind, your judgments, but it's a lot easier than trying to manage the world around you to make you feel what you want to. So, we now have an insight, a very important insight, into what might allow us to be able to change what we feel and therefore get closer to happiness. It's going to have to happen inside. There's no way around that. Whatever we can arrange from the outside, it is, has to involve what happens as far as our interpretations, our judgments, our attitude. Our attitude, after all, is a way of seeing and judging things that are happening negatively or positively. And negatively mean negative feelings, Judging more positively, having a positive attitude, more positive feelings. A very important insight for understanding what we can do to feel more happiness. Now, one of the fundamental aspects of motivation has to do with desire and the satisfaction of desire. We are always being moved by desires. But that means that we're being moved by something we believe that we lack. You wouldn't desire something if you thought you already had it. So, d desire implies a perceived lack. You don't have something, you desire to get it. The satisfaction of a desire comes from feeling, filling that perceived lack of getting what you want. And that is associated with a good feeling. You got what you want, you feel your desire, satisfaction. Now, desire because it moves us, because it moves us towards something is in what you might call the pain part of the pleasure-pain spectrum. It is a dissatisfaction. Someone would have a negative feeling or it wouldn't be moving us. The satisfaction of that desire can be considered a pleasure. So we have pain of desire and the pleasure of satisfaction of that desire. But you cannot feel the pleasure of satisfaction without the preceding pain of desire. They go together. If you're going to have the satisfaction desire, you first need the desire. And this means that there is a, an inherent relationship 
between pain and pleasure. That you have to have the pain of desire before you can get the pleasure of satisfaction. That they are have a symbiotic relationship. This makes things kind of difficult. Think about, um, let's say, a, a desire that you're cold and you come into a warm house and feel the pleasure of being warm. Well, that feeling of pleasure soon goes away, right? But uh, you need, you needed the feeling cold to get the satisfaction of feeling warm. This inherent aspect, this relationship between the pain of desire and, and pleasure of satisfaction means that all of our satisfactions, though, are going to be short-lived. And they need re-stimulization. It's not only that, that when it comes to our, our satisfactions of desires, that a lot of times there's a disappointment that we're not as satisfied as we thought we would be. You know, there's self-sabotage of, of you know, constantly worrying about other things while you're just satisfied or desired. There's also the problem of addiction, is that we're moved to find a pleasure and we become addicted to it. And we can't stop. So there's a lot of, let's say, um, problems associated with desire and, and satisfaction. The satisfactions are quite often subpar, if you will. And it is said by those considered wise that every pleasure exact, exacts its pain. That uh, every pleasure is going to have pain associated with it, which is kind of a depressing thought. I mean, you're trying to find pleasure and there's always going to be problems with it. Unfortunately, there's the human condition for you. And because our satisfactions are always short-lived, there's a term for this, it's called hedonic adaptation, hedonic adaptation. And both experience and the research, the happiness research, show that the satisfaction of desire is almost always short-lived and that we're quickly going to adapt to our feeling and our attention then turns elsewhere. I just mentioned feeling cold and getting the satisfaction of coming in and being warm. It goes away and you're not thinking about the pleasure of being warm anymore. Or you can think about being hungry and then eating and the satisfaction of filling your hunger quickly goes away and in order to feel it again you need to feel hungry again yes problem of being moved by desire finding the satisfaction and then it quickly goes away is fundamental to our lives and it's actually kind of depressing because it means that we're like hamsters on a wheel constantly going and running and running after things that are going away quickly and so we keep running and running and we're not ever getting anywhere. So this is fundamental insight into our motive in, in our lives. Uh, being moved by desires in the hope of satisfying those desires, but they're short-lived, and we have to constantly be running after fulfilling more desires. I think in this category, this, this is, we're talking about the psychology of feelings here, that it is a related concept, desire, satisfaction, involves what we call the ego. Now, the ego is a concept that, um, say, was, was, came out with Freud. 
Freud talked about it and became more of a central focus of psychology. Some would say that, you know, Freud was um, the first modern psychologist and had a great deal of insight. But the subject of the ego is centrally important to understanding our lives. Let me read what Randall Osborne said the ego is. The ego is a variable concept of self, a concept that includes a repertoire of self-images, not necessarily the essence of feeling self, but self-images. And neuropsychology findings actually back the idea that the ego self is somewhat of, of a mirage, an illusion. And the images of self that constitute the ego are constantly changing. They have um, no real solidity. That they're constantly changing. Every time your mood changes, your image of self changes. That uh, every time something happens that causes a, a self-doubt or anything that, that uh, enhances your f feeling your, of self-image at the time creates a short gratification. And here's ego and gratification are two aspects, I think, that go along with desire and satisfaction. At our image is constantly changing. Therefore, is the one's sense of self is inherently unstable. At um, you get up in the morning having a, a, a bad hair day, or that uh, something makes you feel good about yourself, something gives you a, a compliment, etc. That the image of self is constantly changing, it, but it is because of this inherent instability. We can talk about the motivational core of ego. It's really important to understand this. A feeling of insufficiency of self-worth is the motivational core of ego. A feeling of insufficiency of self-worth. The constant changing of, of What you feel, what what um, the about yourself, the self-image, because of its instability. But what how the ego moves us though is to somehow deal with this insufficiency of self-worth that is the very essence of the ego, and this perceived insufficiency constantly drives us to bolster our sense of worth with evidence of our superiority over others or their positive regard for us. If you're going to look for why people need to feel superior, why they need to win, to win an argument, win a game, to win in, in some sort of competition. Why they need that. Why it feels good for them. If you had no doubts about your self-worth, you wouldn't need it. It might be fun playing the game, but who won wouldn't matter. And we're always looking for the positive regard of others. And that's why it feels good when somebody gives us a compliment. When we are congratulated for an achievement. This is so much part of our lives. And what we're constantly trying to please the ego by getting evidence of our self-worth. If you want to talk about a, the motivational core 
of so much of our lives, this is it. We are constantly trying to feel more worthy in our own eyes by feeling either superior or feeling that others love us, their regard for us. We need that evidence. And what that feeling is, is gratification, ego gratification. There's desire and a satisfaction. Well, the satisfaction of the ego craving for feeling more self-worth is ego gratification. And just as with the satisfactions of desires, the ego gratifications are a momentary lessening of doubts about self-worth. And they are pleasurable in contrast to the pain of feeling insufficient. And this is very much the motivational core of our lives. So just as satisfactions of desire, ego gratifications require a proceeding lack, a pain, if you will, of feeling insufficient to be satisfying. If you had absolutely no doubts about your worth, it might be nice if somebody gave you a compliment, but it wouldn't make you feel better. You don't need it. You don't need evidence of your worth. You have no doubts. But how many people have no doubts about their self-worth? You will see that people are driven by their egos, by looking for evidence that they are worthy. But the ego hunger for evidence of worth must, is never sated for long. We have to keep feeding it. And feeding the ego is the core motive of much of our lives. Feeding the ego. It eats, gets some evidence, it never lasts. Just like the satisfactions of desire, it never lasts. So we are seem to be driven you know, in so much of our lives by our desires, by our egos. And the depressing thought is, is that we're never satisfied. We never get there. We have some momentary pleasures and gratifications, and then they're gone. And we're on the hamster wheel. That's kind of a pessimistic understanding of our lives. But it is very much the core. It seems to be then that... Um, Our lives are always needing the pain to get the pleasure and gratification. But are there feelings that do not involve, inherently involve, feeling a need to get the satisfaction or the gratification, to get the pleasure? That is always short-lived. Are there feelings in a different category here? That's the feelings that are highly positive. We want to keep feeling that are not necessarily short-lived and do not need a preceding pain. Actually, I'll be talking about such feelings as we go along and start examining the kinds of feelings. So there is hope that our lives don't have to be just a constant striving on the treadmill. So we're going to start looking at, at the kinds of feelings after this. But here we're, we've been talking about the ego. I have students do an I am exercise. I am. And I tell them to write I am 
10 times on, on subsequent lines of, on a piece of paper. And then I tell them to fill in the blanks, what comes after I am, with what they consider different aspects of their self-identity. I mean, they can, you can include uh, things like um, uh, part of your body identity, you talk about you know, gender, race, body types, etc. You can talk about personality types. You could talk about association identities. For example, your nationality or, or ethnicity or uh, membership in different groups. You can talk about uh, you know, being a member of a fan club for a football team. There are talents that you can talk about. Do you think that describe yourself? The likes and dislikes you have. You know, I am a person who likes chocolate ice cream. Uh, you can talk about beliefs, religious beliefs, etc., that you think identify you. Your preferences for engagement, the things that you like to do. You know, like I am a person who likes sports, or I like I'm a person who likes to read, and. You can ask also, say, well, what am I? And go try to go a little bit deeper here. Say, am I, am I a body? Am, am I a soul? And give your answer to it. So this is an exploration of different things that you think make you who you are, part of your identity. And can, as you consider the 10 aspects that you wrote down, I ask my students, um, are there anything on your list that can change? Is it possible any of them could change? Well, maybe the basic race and, and ethnicity will be difficult. Gender is getting tricky here. <laughs> That uh, um, apparently you can change your, your gender. Other aspects, you know, that uh, about your body that can be changed. And um, religious beliefs, talents, all those other type of things can change. So, so many, so many of the things that we think about of, that are part of our self-identity can change. But anything that can change is not essentially you. What is essentially you would be something that doesn't change. Now I'm going to go a little bit weird here. I ask, pick out a student, and um, I say, you were four years old once, weren't you? And of course, they nod their head. Um, where is that four-year-old? Does that four-year-old still exist? Well, no, it's, it, it's, I grew up, so that four-year-old ceased to exist. It's essentially dead. No, no, no. It's, it, it's, you know, it lives on in memories, and I still have the same body. Well, no, you don't have the same body. The four-year-old you was very different. All the cells have changed. So many things have changed about that body, so that hasn't stayed the same. That it may be that what your body changed into was determined by the same genes, but even genes can change. So many things can change. Yeah. Your self-awareness, your understandings, your preferences, all those things can change. So... Where does that four-year-old exist? Where does it exist? And here, if you're trying to consider what you essentially are, that um, you may start to realize that there's hardly anything about you that doesn't change. And when it comes to anything about the body, well, we're all destined to die. Where is 
that that is essentially us that can never change. And here's where I, I go weird. It's, it's um, those deemed enlightened quite often say that as soon as they felt this realization and they would say of who they really are, they would say, I am. And the Buddha would say, I am, period. And he would say that anything you put after that period is the source of suffering. So I will leave you with that thought and hope that you will join me for the next lecture where, where we will go into hedonic pleasures, a category of feeling. Please join me. Namaste.